co? Może Mają nie. otwarte? Nie wiem. Nie wiesz? We are so glad you are here for tonight's presentation. The Fight for Free Speech, a conversation with author, attorney, and adjunct professor Ian Rosenberg. Ian has over 20 years of experience as a media lawyer and has worked as legal counsel for ABC News since 2003. He graduated with distinction from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and magna cum laude from Cornell Law School. Ian is an Emmy-nominated documentary filmmaker and since 2016 has been a long-standing faculty member teaching media law to Brooklyn College graduate students, some of them are here today, in the MS program in the Department of TV, Radio, and Emerging Media. Ian is the author of The Fight for Free Speech, 10 Cases That Define Our First Amendment Freedoms which Kirk has called in a star review, essential reading for journalists, political activists, and ordinary citizens alike. He is also the author of the graphic novel companion, Free Speech Handbook, with art by Mike Cavallaro from Macmillan First Second. Selected by Young Adult Library Services Association as a 2023 top 10 great graphic novels for teens, for teens. The paperback edition of the Fight for Free Speech with an updated afterward was released by NYU Press in May of this year. And we are here to celebrate that publication. Unfortunately, Brooklyn College Interim Provost, Dr. April Bedford, who is scheduled to be with us this evening is not able to be here as planned. So instead you have me. I am Beth Evans, an associate professor in the library at Brooklyn College. And I serve as the scholarly communications librarian at the college. For those of you who may not know, scholarly communications is all about how research is published and shared. Scholarly communication librarians are proponents of open access and work to support models of publication that preference universal access over economic gain in the dissemination of knowledge. Is it any wonder that when Dr. Gaston Alonso suggested that the Ethel R. Wolf Institute for the Humanities sponsor this event and position it to launch a year of events supported in part by the Frederick Ewan Lecture on Civil Liberties and Academic Freedom, and offered under the banner Freedom to Teach, Freedom to Read, Freedom to Learn, that the CUNY Center for Worker Education, the Brooklyn College Library, 21 academic departments, and two interdisciplinary programs would step up to offer their support. It is no wonder that so many would come forward to support a discussion about what most Americans consider our most fundamental right, our First Amendment right, our right to free speech. We are living in times during which our right to express certain ideas are continually coming under attack. What is truly a wonder is that according to Pan America, Book banning in the United States in the second half of 2022 jumped 28% above where it had been in the first half of that year. And that between 2020 and 2022, 160 K through 12 teachers were fired from or resigned from their jobs because of pressures from the right attacking their teaching an accurate account of American history. Given these challenging times in which we live, I think I can guess, but instead, Ian, tell us, what made you decide to write a book that is so sorely needed, The Fight for Free Speech? 
Uh, well, thank you, Beth. But before I answer that question, I just want to thank everyone um, who's here um, at Brooklyn College um, and um, Brooklyn College in general and the Wolf Institute and Gaston and Lucas Rubin um, for making this all happen. Uh, also, Dr. Bedford and you. Um, thank you, Beth. Um, so why did I write um, this book? Uh, in large part um, because of the class that is here right now. Um, you know, Tony Morrison has a great line that I will paraphrase that says something on the order of, uh, if there's a book that you want to read and it doesn't exist, then you should write that book. Um, and so uh, there, I didn't really feel like there was the right book for this class. Um, my class um, are graduate students in uh, media studies. Um, so they're not lawyers, um, but, um, and there are an enormous amount of books um, written about the First Amendment that are for lawyers and for law students. Um, and there's a lot of books that are sort of, this is what I think the First Amendment should be, the sort of opinion, um, uh, you know, um, sort of essays. Um, and what I was looking to do is really try and find a book that could explain um, what our First Amendment rights are right now um, by looking at 10 key cases from the past. Many of these are the cases that I talk about in my class. Um, and we use each uh, chapter as a way of starting with a contemporary question and then looking at these cases to answer that question for us today while telling the story of the people who fought all the way um, up to the Supreme Court uh, to get their speech rights vindicated. Um, so that was uh, a large part of it. And I also just felt that, you know, in these times that we're in right now, um, and have been for the last, um, you know, five or so years, that people are really clamoring about their free speech rights. They are clamoring to speak and be heard and to sort of demand um, that their free speech rights be um, allowed or vindicated. Um, but I think very few people, uh, understandably, really know what their free speech rights are. Um, and um, so the goal of this book um, is to really condense wisdom without dumbing it down, which is something I firmly believe you can do. Um, and so um, I, you know, my career, I'm a uh, in-house counsel at ABC News. So my career um, is explaining complicated legal concepts to smart people who aren't lawyers. Mm -hmm. um, and that is what I do in my class, hopefully. Um, and so um, I thought it was time that there be a book that um, is for smart people, not lawyers, uh, to have a user's guide uh, to understanding our free speech rights. Thank you. Okay. So here's another question, Ian. Um, student speech yeah. has been challenged in the country, particularly during the Vietnam War, which for a lot of you in this room, perhaps a lot on um, online, is now history. Some of us remember it. And now as students march against gun violence and for climate justice, what rights do American students have to voice their opinions? Well, that was another, um, that's, uh, you mentioned climate justice and, and um, student um, gun rights. Those are both issues um, that my own children um, were concerned about and were thinking about uh, participating in the first national school uh, walk out um, after the tragedy at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. Um, and they asked me, um, you know, what, you know, can we get in trouble for walking out of school? And what are our student speech rights? And so that begins um, my chapter on student speech, uh, which we haven't gotten to in class yet. But, um, uh, and the answer um, goes back to another uh, student um, political activist. Um, her name is Mary Beth Pinker. Um, and she was 13 years old um, in the sort of early stages of the Vietnam War. Uh, and she decided um, that she wanted to wear a black armband, um, that she took cloth out of her mother's sewing um, kit um, and wear it to school to honor the dead on both sides of the war, um, which at the time was a very radical notion that she was honoring um, the dead um, from Vietnam as well as American casualties. Um, and uh, she very bravely wore this um, throughout the day, no real incidents Then she sent to the principal's office. Um, and she talks about how when they, you know, basically pressured her to take it off, uh, she mustered her courage and said, fine. Um, and, and I love that story because she, she took it off and she says, you only need to have a little courage. She had been very brave and wearing it all day. You don't always have to sort of uh, keep fighting, uh, but she would keep fighting. They brought it um, uh, the fight with the school board, uh, they ended up being represented by the uh, Iowa ACLU, um, and it goes all the way up to the Supreme Court. 
-hmm. And Justice Portis um, in um, beautiful language says that students and teachers, but students do not uh, give up their First Amendment rights to free speech and freedom of expression as they pass through the schoolhouse gates. Um, and in the graphic novel, there's a, a great drawing of people literally passing through a uh, metaphorical and visual schoolhouse gate. Um, but what that means is um, this was the first time um, in the late 60s that the court had recognized that student speech rights were as valid and as important um, as adult speech rights. Um, and then they created what's called the reasonable disruption test. Um, basically, the, the idea that they could restrict people's speech was that, um, well, this might lead to a disruption or this might lead to a disturbance. But Fortas talks about how, you know, unpopular opinion could always lead to some type of disagreement or some kind of unpopular um, reaction. Um, and so it's not enough um, that there be some type of uh, dismay in connection with the protest, um, there has to be a, a reasonable belief in a substantial disruption. So that's about a protest in school. But then um, getting back um, to the initial question, um, it would be a substantial disruption to walk out of school um, and um, to cut class. Um, however, um, so you could be punished for that. However, um, the case is following up um, from uh, Tinker versus Des Moines, which is the name of Mary Beth's case, um, show that you can't be punished more for protesting than you could for, say, skipping school or going in, going to the mall or um, or whatever. And you certainly can't be published be, uh, punished um, to a greater degree because the administration doesn't agree with your political beliefs. Uh, and that's the really um, significant um, impact, um, particularly in communities where these protests would be much less popular. Um, so student speech rights are really, um, you know, from the Vietnam War and particularly the, the civil rights movement, uh, Mary Beth Tinker was very inspired um, by black students who had been protesting, um, uh, you know, civil rights violations and, and, and segregation. Um, so, um, so student speech rights are really, I think, at the core. Many of the stories in the book involve young people mm -hmm. um, and their rights are, are quite clear. Well. I'm appreciating now, Ian, that you said you wrote this book for smart people in a language they can understand. And I'm sorry I didn't have this book about 14, 15 years ago. And I think I shared this story with you. My my own Ian, my son Ian, had won a t-shirt for the band. I don't know if the young people here know the band Bad Religion, but he wore a t-shirt for that band to a rather conservative public school fifth grade prom. <laughs> that was a while ago. And he was told to go home and change because um, the student, the administration still objected to that language on a t-shirt. So uh, had he known yeah. um, about, and, you know, this is one of the things um, that I hope people get out of the, the book is that I talk about Supreme Court cases because that's a clear way of saying this is the final version of the law. And there's a dramatic story that, that gets sort of um, decided one way or the other. However, free speech um, issues and free speech violations happen in our lives all the time. Um, and they will never get to the Supreme Court. Um, and um, we need to know as you know, citizens, as people who care about free speech, that um, our rights um, will be trampled on if people don't fully understand them. So I think that you can make a big difference in your community by you know understanding your free speech rights and advocating for them, it doesn't require you to actually you know file a lawsuit or um, or, or take it to the highest level. But um, but I hope um, I hope students uh, who um, feel that their viewpoints are being uh, discriminated against um, in their clothes um, will learn about um, how they do have rights um, and um, and those rights should be fought for and protected. Well, I think this this young man has gotten a lot taller and a lot tougher since he was <laughs> 11 years old. So I, I think he's standing up, as I hope all of you do, too. So, Ian, can you tell us what has changed in First Amendment law from when you wrote this book? And it was published in 2021 to yeah. the release today of the updated paperback. Well, so much has changed. Um, I mean, we have... Um... We had a president, um, uh, President Trump, um, who uh, incited an insurrection and, and was impeached uh, over that. Um, and chapter one um, uh, in this book is uh, about incitement um, and advocacy for illegal action. 
Um, we um, had uh, Justice uh, Ginsburg pass away, uh, being replaced by Amy Coney Barrett, um, which solidified the now six uh, justice supermajority, conservative supermajority on the court. Um, and um, we have uh, Kadanti Brown Jackson becoming the 116th Supreme Court justice, the first black woman to serve on the court. Um, and, and most sort of significantly in, in the constitutional world, we have the Dobbs decision that um, eliminates uh, the constitutional uh, right to ab abortion, which, as Justice Kagan pointed out, not only um, not only uh, terribly impacts um, uh, that vital uh, right for women, but also sort of undermines our notion of the um, of precedent um, and, mm -hmm. and the constitutional system that I'm trying to sort of explain throughout this book. Um, uh, luckily for the First Amendment, um, and luckily for our free speech rights, um, the the court uh, is made up of uh, allies of free speech issues on both the right um, and the left. Um, so I do not believe, um, although I, I think we do have to really worry about um, the nature of, of precedent, um, uh, in the First Amendment context, um, I think we are we are much um, more solid ground. Uh, one of the things I talk about in the updated afterward um, is this great um, case that came out since uh, the first version of the book um, was released um, called um, BL um, versus Mahanoy Maha um, School District. I always um, stutter over the, the school district's name, um, but this is the case of the cursing um, cheerleader on Snapchat. Um, and um, since uh, this is um, not on broadcast television, I can say she um, auditioned for the cheer squad and she auditioned for um, a softball uh, team and didn't get the position she wanted or the um, level on the squad that she wanted. And so she, with her friend at the Coco Hut um, uh, on the weekend, uh, you know, outside, far outside of the school grounds, um, posted a picture of her and her friend that said something close to fuck school, fuck cheer, fuck everything. Um, it was posted just for the 24 hours of Snapchat, um, but she was punished um, by the school district. Um, and she, realizing her tinker rights, um, brought that case up to the Supreme Court. People were very nervous about why it was Supreme Court taking it. Um, it felt like an easy win for her, and people thought, uh, myself included, that this might mean that the Supreme Court was going to back away um, from their speech mm -hmm. rights. Um, but to the contrary, uh, it's the most powerful um, reaffirmation of student speech rights um, in the last 50 years. Um, it's the first one to do so in the social media context. Uh, and Justice Breyer, um, in one of his last major opinions, um, before he retired, um, said that schools are nurseries for democracy uh, and that we cannot um, protect um, and grow our democracy uh, if we restrict the marketplace of ideas. Um, so all this is to say, besides this being one of the key cases that I had not included in, in the book, um, all this is to say that um, everything about that decision um, uh, is explained through one of the cases in the book. So we, we have the marketplace of ideas is discussed in chapter one, um, and uh, we have Tinker, um, uh, and then we talk about how even distasteful speech, like her cursing, um, is protected um, in a case I talk about in the book called uh, Snyder that involves hate speech. So um, so one, I'm, I'm obviously talking about how the book still works, but more importantly, um, uh, our First Amendment um, sort of constitutional approach from the current from the current court um, is staying fairly grounded um, with these cases from the past. Um, now the court just uh, today or yesterday announced they're going to take um, a major social media um, uh, two major uh, social media cases this uh, term. One that they just recently announced. Um, one is going to be about whether um, social media companies uh, can. Um, restrict um, or label um, people's uh, opinions as, you know, not supported or yeah. um, or misleading and whether people can be kicked off of the platform like President Trump was with Twitter. Um, that's one of the uh, key cases uh, that they're taking. And then another case is about whether public figures uh, and government officials, I mean, really just government officials on social media um, can block people from accessing their account if they're using their account um, in a, a public official type way, sort of as part of their um, public duties. So those are two big um, uh, cases on the horizon. Um, but um, but even though so much has changed, 
um, I still believe um, that the structure this book is outlining will help people um, far into the future. So I appreciate that you say that you've chosen to highlight Supreme Court cases because you want to talk about the final decision. And, and that's really helpful to know. I, I don't know why it took me many years to realize that the Supreme Court is presented with thousands of cases. Can, just in case maybe there are others yeah. who are as ignorant as I am that like, what is the process for how they pick a case? Because uh, it's very, it's very limited. Um, and um, one of the things we talk about in our class is that um, at the state and the federal level, you get one appeal automatically. Right. Um, that is required. The, the appeals courts have to take those cases. Um, but at the uh, either the, the highest court of a state or the United States Supreme Court, um, that review is discretionary. Um, so they can take any or none. Um, and actually, the Supreme Court's docket has been decreasing um, in the amount of mm -hmm. cases that they've taken over um, uh, from year to year to year. Um, so um, the, the term is called certiorari, granting certiorari. Uh, it's a Latin term, so some people, sometimes people will say to grant cert. Um, one of the main factors um, that the court looks at is whether there is what is called a circuit split um, or a division among the different um, uh, federal appeals courts um, about how to uh, resolve the same issue. So, for example, in those social media cases um, that I just talked about, in both cases, there are circuit splits. Some courts say that um, you can block um, uh, people, even if you're a government official. Some say you can't. Mm -hmm. On the social media cases um, regarding um, taking people off the platforms or, or editing content, mm -hmm. um, there's a Texas and, and Florida um, split. Um, so that when when the court sees that the federal system is divided on the very same issue, that is often a factor. Um, and then, of course, there's a lot of um, political factors um, uh, that you know that I talk a little bit about in the book, um, which is what court does the uh, what case does the court want to address? Um, sometimes they might want to address an issue, but they don't want to address it with a particular case because okay. the facts go not the way one group of people uh, on the court would want. Sometimes people don't want a case to come before them um, because they think they'll lose, their side will lose, and they want to wait until to sort of um, uh, avoid review until later. So there's a lot of political uh, as well as legal factors that go on. But yes, the, the key thing to know is that it's very few cases uh, end up getting reviewed by the Supreme Court. And if they're not reviewed by the Supreme Court, then it's the next highest uh, court um, that decision stands for their um, mm -hmm. their jurisdiction or, or their part of the country. That's so helpful. Thank you. Sure. So I almost feel like you've answered this, but but maybe not. Um, can you tell us what you feel is the biggest threat today to free speech rights? Uh, I don't think I've answered uh, what I think is the biggest threat, um, and it certainly come up after uh, I wrote the first version of the book. Um, it's book bans. Um, this is Ban Books Week. Um, you have your great T-shirt. Um, uh, we're doing this talk in part um, to um, to you know sort of do teach-ins about uh, the real threat that we're under in this country um, for book bans. Pen America, as, as, as you mentioned some of this uh, in your intro, um, Pen America is talking about how there are. Um, certainly the, the large number of book bans um, in, in uh, recent memory. Um, the last I remember looking at it, it was over 15, uh, over 1,400 um, different book titles have been banned so far this year. The American Library Association had a similar um, statistic from last year's review. Um, I, I believe it was over 1,500, which was the highest that, um, ever in their um, recording of this issue. Um, and um, this is what I would say falls into the uh, the category of a vital free speech issue that is not um, that is um, not necessarily clear in the law. So it's sort of free speech in theory um, and maybe less a First Amendment right. Uh, one of the cases I didn't do a censorship case in the book is because the one case about it um, is very complicated. Um, but very briefly, um, called Island Trees School District, took place in New York, um, where there was a book ban um, of a number of different books um, by um, Bernard Malamud, Kurt Vonnegut, um, Richard Wright, um, Langston Hughes, a collection that had been edited um, by Langston Hughes. Um, and uh, the school district said it was anti-Christian, anti-Semitic, 
you know, and just plain filthy. Um, none of these books, in my opinion, are filthy, um, but it goes up to the Supreme Court and in a divided decision, um, five to four, um, the court says um, two important things. One um, is that there is a First Amendment right to receive information, not just to speak, um, but to hear how can we have a marketplace of ideas if there's no one who is listening in that market or if, um, uh, th those people have rights as well, not just the people who are speaking in the market. Um, and the court um, is willing to say in that case, you know, although very divided, that um, that libraries, uh, that, that books can't be restricted from libraries simply because some authority, some governmental authority disagrees with the content of the books. Um, now, that sounds like a sort of robust defense, but what they're getting at um, is that the court has backed away from protecting books being removed from um, curriculums um, or for editorial reasons why books um, might not be approved. So there's a big difference. You have a lot greater First Amendment law protection um, if you're talking about a library book ban than if you're talking about removing a book. Um, from the curriculum as, say, Mouse, the graphic novel about the Holocaust was being uh, threatened to be removed from curriculums um, in certain uh, school districts. Um, and that's the court has already, always been, even in Tinker, very concerned about being a sort of uber school board um, or um, in interfering with state choice about the educational system. Um, but again, I think this goes into the category of you might not win a lawsuit. And I, I, I think actually this court... Um, even though they're generally pro free speech, they care a lot about, uh, about religious issues and they care a lot about um, school choice issues. Um, so I don't know that this current court would be so supportive of uh, a, a sort of a reaffirmation of that principle. Um, so I don't think this is a time when the court is going to save us. I do think that this is a time uh, and a challenge and a real threat. Um, that we need to sort of advocate for free speech rights in principle. And of course, in principle, the foundations of our First Amendment rights, the idea that the best chance of an um, idea is to get itself uh, accepted in the um, back and forth of the market. That's the marketplace of ideas principle that undergirds uh, sort of all of modern First Amendment law that I talk about in chapter one. Um, that principle makes no sense if books are being taken out of the market. Um, and, um, and, you know, one of the main ways in which people always try and restrict speech is to say some version of it's offensive. Um, and um, a, a number of the cases in the book deal with different kinds of offensive speech, whether it's, you know, protesting that people might find offensive, whether it's cursing um, in a famous case about um, a guy wearing a jacket that said, fuck the draft, that's in the, um, the book. Um, and also uh, the much more serious um, offense of hate speech um, and uh, the harm that that causes. So, um, so saying that these books are pornographic or these books are 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 uh, dangerous um, is always the way people try and restrict speech. Uh, and I think we really need to know about our our sort of free speech principles um, and do everything we can um, to speak up against such restrictions. Well, you have my support on that. Of course, you know, as a librarian, um, I mean. It's, it's come to the point where there, um, I believe in Utah, someone has suggested that the Bible will be banned because of subject matter. Yeah. Um, there, I, I read today briefly that there's a Florida district saying they were going to remove all books involving any gay characters. Right. Uh, and yeah. of course, um, these restrictions are almost always targeting LGBTQ or people of color, uh, books about them or books um, by them. Yeah. It's um it's gotten pretty bad. Um, and they um I I love to say this, especially when there are students from Brooklyn College in the room. I was actually a Brooklyn College undergraduate, and I was an English major, English literature, and I really love the 17th century. So we read Milton, and uh, um the piece he wrote is getting a lot of attention lately, the Areopagitica, because his his piece was actually in protest to the policy of banning books before they were even published, mm -hmm. grabbing them off the printing press because of some objection. And um, 
That's that's almost science fiction there, right? It's well, really yeah, scary. Um, it's tremendously scary, but it's also um, it's also the idea of prior restraint, which I, I cover in the book, which is yeah. um, the Pentagon Papers case um, is what most people know. The idea that um, the Nixon administration tried to stop uh, the New York Times and then the Washington mm-hmm. Post for publishing from publishing they had published some, but publishing additional articles. Um, about these top secret um, Vietnam War documents that had been leaked to them, um, and that is that is the you know, the press uh, analog of uh, of this ancient worry um, is that um, if some restrictions uh, chill speech, uh, a prior restraint, meaning the inability to publish something, you know, really freezes speech. Um, and so the the victory um, in the Pentagon Papers case. Um, is that even during wartime, this case went on during the Vietnam War, even with, you know, top secret documents, the highest level of, of, of secret classification, uh, even when there was some people arguing that there would be threats to national security um, and, and to our troops abroad, um, even then uh, the court ha- uh, says that um, prior restraints are almost always presumptively unconstitutional. Um, so, um so that's that's a helpful fact in terms of, of of book bans. Although I'm not sure the court would apply it that way, but um, but it's another um, it's another way in which these sort of ancient issues get played out in, in modern ways throughout um, free speech law. Okay, so um, I have a note here that we might have reached the point where we're ready for additional questions, but I think we have room for a couple more for me there, and and then hand it over to the audience. But I see there's something in the chat, and um, maybe we can take a look at that first, see if there is a question. There's a link. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Gaston. Uh, yes, from Penn. Um, uh, Penn America, which is a great advocacy organization fighting against um, book bans. Um, I would also recommend, of course, the American Library Association um, and um, the Comic Books Legal Defense Fund. Um, they are a great um, advocacy organization as well. Uh, a number of the books that are being banned today, as a matter of fact, last year, the number one um, book being banned uh, is a graphic novel memoir called Gender Queer. Um, uh, and the current head of the Comic Book Legal Defense Fund talks a lot about how um, there's something about graphic novels um, that make people, um, it's their immediacy and their, um, and their sort of graphic power that makes people um, sort of more incensed um, by them. Um, also, maybe because um, a lot of people seeking to ban books aren't reading them, so they're at least flipping through the, the pages of graphic novels. But um, but those are um, two other organizations I would recommend uh, for people to get involved with. I can see a question here that you haven't touched on yet, so I'd like to ask you, Ian. The First Amendment is usually thought of in terms of protecting what people say. But in your book, you explain that it also protects against compelled speech. What what does such protections mean for Colin Kaepernick's take a knee protest, for example? Right. So that's um, uh, one of the the kickoffs of one of the chapters in the book. Um, I think Kaepernick um, is really the the consummate protester of our age um, and was really prescient um, in his message before the resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement uh, after the tragic uh, murder of, of George Floyd. Um, so I, I talk about the, uh, the take of knee, um, journey, um, Kaepernick's take of knee journey. Um, and then I also, um, talk about, um, this, this right not to speak, um, which again comes from student protesters. Um, this time student protesters, um, who were Jehovah's Witnesses during World War II, uh, right before, um, and, and then during World War II. And they felt, um, that, um, pledging allegiance to the flag in class as it was required in many school districts at the time, um, violated um, their beliefs regarding idolatry and uh, and bearing false witness to idols. Um, and so they refused. Um, they really suffered terrible consequences um, uh, and persecution. Um, and um, but the case uh, again goes up to the Supreme Court um, when uh, the, we are now in the, the midst of, of World War II fighting against fascism um, and, and fighting ostensibly uh, against uh, compelling people to uh, adhere to a fascist uh, message they don't believe. Um, and uh, in the course of the case, Justice Jackson um, creates uh, or, or reveals sort of that there is a right not to speak. 
Um, and that had never been articulated that before. Not that they needed some religious exception from this rule, but that there's a First Amendment right against compelled speech. And he talks about how, um, you know, compel, compelling people uh, to speech, I'm paraphrasing here, but leads to um, the compulsion of the graveyard. Um, that there's one step, um, uh, it's a short step um, from forcing people to say things they don't believe um, to literally um, killing people um, uh, because of their uh, beliefs. Um, so there is um, a right not to speak. Um, there is a right to not have the government compel you to express a message you don't believe in. Um, but in terms of Colin Kaepernick, um, one of the other sort of themes throughout the book um, is that the First Amendment only protects you against government interference with your speech. After all, it says Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of the speech or, or of the press. Mm -hmm. That through the 14th Amendment um, is expanded to mean both Congress and the states and, and state actors. Um, but Kaepernick was working um, for a private employer, the NFL. Um, and unfortunately, I think this is a surprise to many people, uh, you have almost no free speech rights um, in connection uh, with your employment with a private employer, um, a private meaning not a state a government actor. Um, so while Kaepernick um, does not have um, a First Amendment sort of right, First Amendment theory, yes, First Amendment spirit, absolutely, but a First Amendment uh, legal right um, to, um, uh, to fight against the NFL um, for their restriction of, of his speech. He doesn't have that. Of course, his lawsuit was about collusion and that's a, 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 to basically eliminate him from, from the league right. based on his viewpoint. That's a different thing. He, he settled that. But but his, but about the protest, settled that in his favor, we all believe in normal, um, experts agree. Um, but um, so Kaepernick cannot um, use the right not to speak against the NFL. However, um, if you are a student um, or you are um, working for a governmental organization, this comes up most with students. If you are a student and you do the same protest and you take a knee at or the equivalent at some school sponsored event, public school event, um, then the Barnett case, those are those Jehovah's Witness um, uh, young students I was mentioning, um, uh, the Barnett sisters, um, you absolutely can um, cite that case um, and say that uh, there is a First Amendment right um, that prohibits um, government actors from punishing me uh, if I don't if I'm unwilling to express a message I don't believe in. So uh, one of the sort of fascinating um, wrinkles of First Amendment um, doctrine is that students actually have, or people um, working for governmental um, uh, agencies um, or part of a governmental system, uh, actually have greater rights um, than Kaepernick for the same protest. So then expanding on that a little, and since we are, um, you've spoken about students a lot this mm -hmm. evening, um, are students, um, do students have greater or lesser free speech rights depending on if they go to a private university versus a public university? Absolutely. They, they have no free speech, speech, speech rights at private universities. Uh, I mean, that, that private university might grant them some um, some promise of rights and might have some governing yeah. documents that do that. Um, but it's one of the great things about public schools um, uh, and um, uh, that you have um, uh, very strong free speech rights in connection with the government um, restricting your speech or government actors and, and school teachers and administrators have long been um, uh, found to be government actors. Um, but you have no, uh, essentially no uh, free speech rights um, in connection with private employers or private schools. That's really interesting, and it's another reason to appreciate CUNY yes. and Brooklyn College, yes. and really, really appreciating that. Thank you. So that actually ties in a bit, too, with one additional question now, and then we should, um, I'm hoping people are thinking of questions, but related to social media, because my understanding is that, you know, Facebook could um, remove people because it's a private corporation. And um, so could you address that a little bit about, um, as, as it's phrased here, how has social media and the internet impacted free speech rights and the concept of the marketplace of ideas? Well, so the last chapter in the book um, is the Supreme Court's, at the time, only significant um, discussion of social media speech. Mm -hmm. um, they were late to the game, it was in the late 2000s. Um, and um, at that point, Justice Kennedy, in one of his last opinions, significant opinions, um, talks of the case that came up to them was a um, person who was a convicted sex offender 
um, posted on Facebook about beating a traffic ticket and says, um, uh, God is good. I, I beat this traffic ticket. Um, a very dogged uh, officer um, realized that even though he was using a fake name, that that was somebody who had been a sex offender. Um, and there was a North Carolina law that prohibited sex offenders from having essentially any access to social media, not just in some context with avoiding children or, or interacting mm -hmm. with children, but uh, or about that topic, but zero um, social media access. Um, and the court, Justice Kennedy, um, talks about how, um, you know, we've long talked about where is the most important places for free speech. Is it in schools? Is it in public parks? Is it um, on, you know, sort of streets, public streets? And he says, wherever it, uh, it may be in the past, it's certainly today in the vast democratic forums of the internet and including social media. So he looks at, at social media as the sort of um, town crier uh, with a megaphone on steroids um, and um, thinks that we can't be talking about, I think correctly, thinks that we can't be talking about uh, our free speech rights unless we're also including our rights to, to again, use social media, uh, to hear and receive speech on social media. Um, so that's um, the big case on social media that even restricting such, um, uh, you know, undesirable people as former sex offenders um, even they have a right to access uh, social media. So government interference with um, access to social media, um, uh, meaning the ability to access it, not the ability to be on a particular platform, um, uh, it is pretty clear. Um, but um, but we then go back to the, the topic I bring up in the beginning of that book um, is uh, the comedian Sasha Baron Cohen, famous for Borat, mm -hmm. talking about all the uh, anti-Semitism um, and hate speech that is online um, uh, being controlled by what he calls the Silicon Six. Um, and, um, you know, uh, there is no um, easy First Amendment right um, explanation um, about how to deal with that kind of hate speech um, and, and how to deal with those kind of um, uh, tremendous problems. Um, uh, but um, one way that um, social media platforms are trying to deal with it is through um, restricting, people say they don't do enough, and I agree, but um, through restricting certain types of hate speech, certain types of um, false or misleading statements, perhaps about, um, about COVID treatments, um, about election fraud, um, and that um, should have been, based on uh, this case, um, uh, that should have been, um, Packingham is the name of the case, that should have been um, very clear uh, that um, as private entities, there is no First Amendment um, way in which um, Facebook or, um, or Twitter or what have you can um, be stopped from moderating their content. Uh, in fact, even if there was the bias on social media, which I do not think is proven, but um, even if there was a bias on social media, Twitter would have the right, or X today would have the right um, to say that you know no one can speak about Black Lives Matter, or that no Republicans can speak, or that no Democrats can speak. That is actually, as a private platform, there is no First Amendment interference with that. Um, meaning there's no way to use it as a sword or a shield. Um, however, the, the Supreme Court being willing to take these two cases um, that were basically based on um, conservative activists uh, saying that uh, platforms um, kicking people off for supposedly their conservative views or arguably for um, saying, you know, false things about election fraud or um, COVID treatments, um, uh, should be um, prohibited, that that, uh, that the First Amendment should prevent um, social media companies from having the, the right to sort of moderate their content as they see fit. Um, that seems to me totally inconsistent um, with Packingham and sort of inconsistent with general free speech principles um, that private companies can do what they want. I Previous to the Supreme Court agreeing to take these cases, I often said that this was an example of how private companies being able to do what they want is a good thing. Um, if um, Because it le they're not doing enough to police hate and to police uh, untruths um, online, but um, but at least they are able to do that um, without um, government interference. Um, you know, it's sort of too early to say what this will mean for the court. I don't think there's gonna be a, a fundamental change um, in social media speech law. Um, but right now, um, Packingham is the, the court's only significant discussion of it. And their overarching principle is that social media is as protected, if not more so, um, than movies or television or books or newspapers. Uh, every time there's a new technology, the court sort of 
has to decide whether, oh, are we adding this in? You know, it was always really just sort of newspapers. Um, and then with movies for a long time, they're like, oh, well, movies don't count. Um, and then um, they bring in movies. And then um, now we have um, social media. So um, uh, or the court looked at violent video games before that. So, you know, there, uh, the court is usually willing to say that um, the new technological developments, the platform or the format doesn't matter. The free speech mm -hmm. principles still apply. And I, I think they're going to continue to go in that direction, um, but, I, I, but I'm not sure. Well, there is a um, case that's in the lower courts um, involving the Internet Archive. I don't know if people here are familiar. Right. Um, you may be familiar with the Wayback Machine. That's what gives you the content that has been taken down from the internet because it's being preserved through this organization. And they're I'm wondering if there's a um, case where they were uh, allowing the circulation of digitized copies of books that libraries own during the period of time when people couldn't actually get into the library. And um, so they were sued by publishers for violating the sort of one copy, right? So the reason libraries can buy a book and lend them out is because you're free to do whatever you want with your one copy of a book. Right. But um, I can't take this and put it in a photocopy machine and then sell you those copies. Right. So digital, um, this digitization of books, because I thought of it when you mentioned about format that it's, it's really this, this concern now about what changes when we look at different formats, or does anything change at all? Uh, well, I think there is there is continually that question of, of what changes when we look at different formats. And mm -hmm. and one of the, I usually don't do a lot of theory in the book, but one of the, the theory, um, theoretical frameworks is, you know, is, is the internet, um, uh, is the internet different? Um, is it an exceptionalist approach mm -hmm. or is it, uh, sort of a traditional um, approach. Um, in those cases, though, that you're referring to with with uh, the Internet Archive, that's really a lot about copyright law, um, and so uh, which there is an intersection um, of, of free speech law um, and copyright law, particularly in uh, the areas of parody or or, right. or fair use. Um, but those are mostly copyright decisions. Um, so I think it's beyond the scope of what we're talking about today. Um, I agree, um, but, but I did think about format change. But, but format change is, um, is uh, really impacting all of this. Uh, yeah, uh, no, that, that is sort of a contemporary way of, of looking at um, new, new questions. OK, so I see we do have a question in the chat. And um, look, is it? Uh, do you want me to read it out loud? Or um, uh, can sure, I, I, I can actually see it uh, with my context. Um, I have a question. Can you speak to how the First Amendment and the right not to have one speech compelled was used in creative versus Elena's, and what do you make of this new way of using this right? Um, so, uh, 303 Creative, I, I believe, you know, this is the case of the uh, the woman um, who had a website design company and said that, you know, state um, laws, um, state anti discrimination laws, um, uh, threatened her ability to express her message uh, because she, as a her form of Christianity, did not believe that she would want to take a website um, for a gay uh, couple. Um, this was a follow-up to the court's uh, Masterpiece Cake Shop um, decision, um, which was about a baker with the same um, set of uh, issues that said uh, they wanted to make wedding cakes, but they didn't want to make wedding cakes for, for gay couples. Um, originally, I was going to do Masterpiece Cake Shop as one of the last chapters of my book, but it's such a terrible decision, terrible not only because I disagree with it, but terrible um, also because it's so convoluted and unclear. Um, creative um, versus Ellenis is equally um, unclear um, in that uh, basically the court is saying, yes, uh, the court is using, the majority is saying that um, that there is a, that to be forced um, to, in theory, forced to um, do a website for a couple uh, whose religious beliefs or whose um, marriage you don't agree with um, uh, is a form of compelled speech. Um, however, I, I just think that metaphor doesn't work in any way. Um, first of all, um, when you're an artist and you sell your work, um, an artist has to take all comers. Um, so, um, 
you, you, um, if you don't want to create a painting on a certain topic, that's fine. You don't know one can make you uh, create a painting on a certain topic. But if you're selling that painting, uh, you can't then say, oh, you're Jewish. I don't sell these uh, paintings to Jewish people. Um, uh, similarly, um, and there's also just factual flaws in that case. She never actually, uh, there's a fundamental principle of, of, of law, not as constitutional law, that you actually have to have, you can't just sort of bring theoretical cases before the court. Uh, you have to have a, a dispute. Um, there was no one who had actually asked her to make um, this website. It was unclear how many such websites she had even made. This did feel like the court was picking this case because they wanted to uh, move past the sort of equivocating um, uh, decision that Justice Kennedy had uh, done in Masterpiece Cake Shop. Um, it, it, there is no, in my mind, there is no way that you can square that um, decision with essentially all of anti-discrimination law that we have. Um, people used to say um, that their religious beliefs prevented them from uh, letting, um, you know, black people, um, you know, stay at their hotel. Um, um, people used to say religious beliefs allowed people um, uh, to um, not have uh, believed that um, people of different races should be able to marry. Um, the, it seems to me that there is no limit um, to what the court is doing um, uh, in that case, um, unless what we are talking about um, is just that uh, on the topic of religious um, freedom of expression um, or, or religious free exercise, uh, I mean to say um, that this court um, is always going to side um, with uh, with conservative Christians. Uh, I, I mean, I, I, I just, <laughs> that is not a, a theoretical answer. I've talked to my students uh, a little bit about the, the theory of legal realism, which is the idea that law is what the judge had for breakfast. In other words, that all these sort of big theoretical um, uh, constructs um, and, and theories don't really matter. It's just about political power and about what the judge wants to do. Uh, I, I just don't see any uh, other uh, interpretation that makes sense. So um, I don't see this as a, uh, you were absolutely right, whoever asked the question, this is about um, uh, compelled speech, but I think it's totally misapplied in this uh, in this context. Uh, as you can tell, I, I, um, I'm really holding back on my uh, political thoughts mm -hmm. here. Um, so, uh, but anyway, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a complicated and um, very disturbing decision. Has left the barn on this one. Uh, well, I mean, and again, I would say that's really the, the the free exercise sort of. I mean, it is a speech decision, but I think the court is looking at it in the sort of the religion clauses context, which is the other part of the First Amendment that I don't get into the um, in the book. Um, the other major part. Um, so, um, so it's possible it could be sort of cabined off that way too. But uh, interesting question, and there's not a satisfying answer. I don't think. You have me wondering if the the court as a sort of sense of, well, um, we're in the mood for free speech this year. So let's take some free speech cases. Well, you know, Justice Roberts, it's not just this year. I mean, Justice Roberts, um, Chief Justice Roberts, um, considers himself, um, as I mentioned in the book, he, he considers himself the, the foremost champion on the court uh, of free speech. I think he sort of overhypes himself, um, but he does care uh, uh, about free speech. Um, and um, and the court has fairly consistently, um, you know, over a period of from the 1920s to today, um, cared uh, about free speech. Now, um, whose free speech do they care about? There's, there are interesting uh, critical race theory um, and uh, feminist theory and equality theory arguments that they uh, really care about. Uh, the speech of people in power, um, particularly white men. Um, uh, and that's um, not something I really get into the book, um, except in the footnotes, I, I make references to, to different people's critiques. Um, but um, but uh, but there is a consistent interest in the First Amendment, and I don't think it's just the fashion. I think what's just the fashion uh, is what the new conservative supermajority wants to uh, deal with in terms of religious rights, um, uh, conservative uh, Christian religious rights, um, and I think a very disturbing um, bellwether um, toward restricting uh, LGBTQ rights. Um, I, I think that's that, that's another offshoot of Dobbs, um, is that um, if Dobbs principles um, for abortion rights um, uh, can be taken away, uh, Obergefell um, and 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 uh, the right to same-sex um, marriage, um, it, it can also uh, be taken away. And, that's a disturbing likelihood. 
Well, I know that free speech rights have even figured into the um, abortion legislation on state levels because um, there were situations where people could be prosecuted for, and, and this came up in higher ed, for example, in student health clinics in very conservative states, the right to discuss the options for um, a woman or a pregnant person who comes in, like they can't even talk about, you know, or the idea of talking over the phone about um, self, you know, self, um, to give yourself, you know, through so, medicate, medic, oh, you know, like medicate a, a, a proportion that you uh, perform yourself, right? With so, so that even, you know, because that would be like just talking about it and not actually even engaging in it. Yeah, that, that's pretty scary. Uh, the court and the court had in the abortion context that they kept sort of encroaching on abortion rights, the, the court um, uh, has not defended the speech rights of doctors um, um, and has defended the speech rights uh, of people who were advocating um, against abortion um, and in favor of carrying uh, 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 fetuses to term. Um, so in that case, um, one can look at it um, as uh, a, a law um, uh, in the First Amendment um, sort of doctrine, um, or you can look at it that, again, in terms of politics, that the abortion issues um, uh, was always a primary and um, uh, their their actual focus on, on speech was, was quite secondary. Gaston, I see you have your hand up. Does that mean there's another question? Uh, there's a question in the chat, and then there's a question from Gabrielle. Uh, should I read the question in the chat and then go to Gabrielle? Uh, sure. So on uh, the chat, David asks, how is the Santos don't say gay bill able to stand? That is, why isn't it obvious? Why isn't it an obvious violation of the First Amendment as you described it? Or are there other mitigating factors? Uh, you know, I don't really know enough about the details of what it actually says in, in the don't say gay bill. Um, although I agree with you on, on First Amendment principles um, uh, that um, a restriction of, of viewpoint speech um, goes against um, First Amendment law. Um, you know, but taking a step back, you know, when people say, how is something allowed to stand that, that comes up? Well, you say that there's this right, but then somebody did this thing, you know, in this case, a governor did this thing um, that seems totally contradictory to that. That is the slow nature, nature of our um, of our judicial system. Um, and as Beth was raising earlier, you know, not all cases are, are taken by the Supreme Court, even if they get up to the Supreme Court. So. Um, all the time, um, we can have laws um, passed that are, uh, in my opinion, and I think many legal experts' opinion, um, uh, you know, overtly unconstitutional. Um, but that doesn't mean that the law is sort of magically disappears um, uh, as soon as somebody points that out. Um, there has to be a legal challenge, uh, and that legal challenge can take years um, to wind its way um, up, even before you get to the Supreme Court, it can take years. So uh, once again, um, that is why being an advocate um, for free speech rights is so important because it is fighting for free speech is, a, uh, as I like to say, um, a, a grassroots activity. Um, it is something that we need to do every day in our community board meetings, in city councils, in our um, places of worship, um, in our school districts. Um, we need to be fighting for free speech um, and uh, and advocating um, for uh, laws to change even before the courts um, might eventually uh, vindicate or uh, such rights or, or strike down such uh, troubling um, bills or, or laws. Thank you. You have Gabrielle and Brett uh, waiting for with their questions. Sure. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so um, I'm a children and youth studies major at Brooklyn College. So I was um, pertaining to book banning. Um, when it comes to book banning, one of the major arguments is that parents should have control over what their children are learning and reading within the classroom. However, um, since we're um, speaking about freedom of speech, isn't book banning also going against the child's right to free speech? Uh, absolutely. I mean, I think I think you raised that's one of the, the key points. It, it goes against the, the child's um, 
rights to receive information. Um, and, and also, um, you know, parents do, parents do have um, rights to control what their kids read. They can control what their kids read at home. If they don't want their kids reading certain things, they can control that. I mean, I don't support it, but like they can control that um, by telling their kids not to read it. But what's so objectionable about book bans is that it's not parents um, saying what they want to um, have their kids read or not read. It's what some very small, usually very small group of parents say that they want nobody's kids to read. Um, and that interferes with not only the students' rights, but with the rights of all the other parents in the community. And usually it is a vocal minority of uh, people who have these ideological issues um, that they want um, to, you know, um, fight about um, that um, don't represent the majority or, um, uh, or even any significant portion of necessarily the community where those books are being restricted. Um, and it's so much more disturbing um, when it when in the library context. Um, again, if you want to control what your kids read in the library, then you as a parent have the right to try and control that. Um, but the idea that you can restrict it for everyone in the community um, because of your ideas about parental control really just not only um, do I disagree with it politically, but it doesn't make logical sense. If you care about parental rights, then parents should be able to um, you know, make decisions only for their children um, and not impact the decisions of, of so many um, parents and students throughout the community who uh, are now um, having limited access to um, books that they otherwise um, had been selected for the merit and the content that, that they provide. So uh, I think you raise a, a really important point. And what's happening, um, if I may add, in, in school libraries, particularly in Florida, because there was some legislation passed that required that anything on the bookshelves in the school libraries needed to go through a review process, the um, librarians were so terrified they pretty much emptied their shelves. And so, um, you know, it, it's just, it's it's not a situation that you can feel is, is healthy. Um, there are many, many testimonials out there of people saying that it was because of reading something in a library as a child or an adolescent that they finally felt some kind of affirmation for something they believed in or for who they were, what they saw themselves as, particularly coming up in the LGBTQ community, that you know, having access to information that allows you to um, sort of think through things rationally has been life-saving. And it's um, just incredibly frightening. I, I know that I think one of Ian's messages here this evening is the kind of like, it's it's not a spectator sport. You know, <laughs> this is something that we need to be engaged in continually. Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, so th there's one more question. Somebody else had their hand raised to the video. Yes. Hello, uh, my, so basically you said that um, NFL players aren't protected by the uh, First Amendment, but um, so I was curious, like what rights do they really have then? Like, are they just being paid to be silent? And like, is there anything in your book that can sort of help like maybe an, an athlete who finds himself in a position like Colin Kaepernick? Uh, unfortunately, no, right. They're being, uh, they're being paid, um, to do the game of the sport, but 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 I don't want it to be um, you know I'm not agreeing with this principle. Um, I don't think that there actually is anything that Kaepernick did that in any way uh, detracted from his ability to play the sport. Um, uh, but um, or to, you know, uh, but um, private employers, not just the NFL, um, any kind of private employer um, has the right um, to you know to uh, fire you, uh, go as far as fire you um, for your speech. Uh, the only exceptions would be, um, I mean, there are very, very few. I mean, uh, um, uh, basically, you, uh, again, the, the structure of this isn't about necessarily about what can you or can you not do with your private employer. The idea is that the First Amendment is you know, textually based um, on the idea that Congress um, shall uh, uh, not restrict um, our right to freedom of speech or um, or um, expression, um, uh, and and that is 
all essentially all of the First Amendment case law involves some form of government action. Now, to your point about sort of like, well, what like sort of what hope um, is there um, uh, for um, for players or or for other um, private employees? Um, I mean, I think there's there's two things to look to um, somewhat hopefully. Um, you know, one is that um, is is the idea that. Uh, it's it just how right um, Kaepernick, of course, turned out to be um, that, you know, the, there was at least, a, you know, speaking out against um, uh, police violence against black people um, was um, a very politically unpopular um, uh, move in much of the white community um, uh, who was receiving that protest or watching that protest um, uh, uh, to a certain degree, at least after the Black Lives Matter resurgence. Um, uh, that came after the tragic death of George Floyd. Um, there's a little bit more awareness, I think, in, in the white community, and, and even the NFL sort of uh, quasi apologized um, to Kaepernick. Um, I mean, I think you know there is a, this idea that um, dissent is um, popular. We sort of look at Dr. King and we say we always celebrate dissent. Like we have a we have a Martin Luther King Day, and and we 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 celebrate dissenting voices. That's the sort of the nature of America. But dissent is almost always unpopular when it happens. Um, in fact, Dr. King's march on Washington was unpopular with the majority of Americans at the time it happened. Um, and um, you know, as was um, you know, anti-war um, protests during the Vietnam War, particularly at the beginning of the war. Um, as you know, I begin the book talking about anarchists who were um, against um, Americans' uh, involvement in Russia during World War One. Now, anarchists seem sort of charming and um, and and interesting, but um, in its day, uh, that was considered a, a really um, threatening um, uh, philosophy um, for the American experience. So. So protest often takes on a sort of rosy glow of inevitability in, um, in when we look at it um, in the past. Uh, and I think we need to remember that um, that um, unpopular speech is at the core of the First Amendment and that employers um, really need to not focus on what's popular or unpopular, um, but to really focus on whether um, you know, such speech actions in any way impact their job negatively. So I, I think this is a free speech, sort of free speech spirit, um, but unfortunately not free speech law um, that, that supports um, their rights to make these kind of um, you know, silent, respectful protests uh, during their job. But uh, in terms of a lawsuit, um, they're not going to win. Thank you. Well, that's a positive note. <laughs> Somewhat <laughs> positive. I think there's maybe, uh, guess no, is there one more question? We could maybe do one or two um. more. Actually, I was going to jump in myself. Uh, um, I, you know, a lot of this conversation about these cases involving school districts or involving um, public libraries, you know, we sort of get the different episodes, but there is an organized movement in the country, right, to ban and silence certain kinds of content, certain kinds of voices. And, you know, a number of people will say that the answer to this has to be political. It has to be done through political channels rather than legal channels. So I'm going to ask you to speak for your profession uh, and to let us sort of for the school board member under pressure um, to agree to certain kinds of bans or for the librarian who's facing the kinds of pressures that um, Beth raised uh, or for the student who is being banned from being able to have access to information. Right. What can the legal process do um, for them that some, yeah, rather than the political process. How could we attack these kinds of bans from a legal perspective rather than through sort of addressing the deeper issues uh, through political strategies? Well, to a certain degree, um, the organizations that, that we've talked about, um, you know, the, uh, and also in, you know, the good old ACLU, um, uh, are legal organizations that will help um, even when there's not perfect law um, uh, to fight against book bans um, that will try and um, help, um, uh, if not bring a lawsuit, uh, at least put on political pressure in the sense that um, there is the threat of a potential lawsuit um, or talking about um, how this um, violates uh, the Constitution. But what I would say is actually, um, and what my real goal with this book and um, uh, and more importantly, with with First Amendment law in general, um, is is that people um, that the best tools that we have um, to sort of advocate against 
um, speech restrictions today that are happening um, are to look back at the cases of the past and talk about how um, they are violating the, the spirit and the principles of, uh, of our constitutional law. Um, you know, um, I'm not a textualist or a, uh, an original intent, but but we can certainly say that the framers of this country, um, you know, care deeply about speaking out against the, the, the government of the time, which was the, the English crown. Um, so um, the idea of the marketplace of ideas, which began in, in a 1920s case called Abrams that I talked about at the beginning of the book, is still today, as I mentioned in uh, the um, Snapchat case, um, still today the central metaphor. So I would argue that you can use legal um, stories of the past and, and legal theories of the past and legal metaphors like the marketplace of ideas to talk about um, and hopefully bolster um, the um, scared school board member or the, the nervous librarian um, um, to say that there is a there is a philosophical framework um, that is at what our country is at its best um, supportive of um, that is completely uh, opposed to such restrictions. Um, uh, you know, um, like I said, sometimes the court is all about power, um, but um, but there is a, I believe, um, inspiring and, and consistent, relatively consistent, um, uh, you know, sort of through line um, of uh, supporting free expression, of protecting dissent, defending the press, um, you know, resisting governmental restrictions uh, on speech, um, uh, expanding the marketplace of ideas. Uh, and also um, allowing speakers to express messages as they choose. Those are the sort of five maxims I have at the end of the book. And I think almost all of those um, can be used um, in a way to hopefully um, bolster people's um, beliefs in um, protecting free expression um, and fighting against uh, censorship. Um, but it, it's, a, it's, a tough, um, it's a tough road and there are no um, easy solutions. And um, on behalf of my profession, I'm sorry that there's not more that we can do, but, um, but in some of these cases, um, I think that uh, grassroots um, speech advocacy uh, is going to be a lot more powerful than uh, threatening a lawsuit. I, I, I wholly respect and value your profession uh, and your contributions to this, which has made this event so valuable tonight. So thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, well, it seems like we're wrapping up and I know we're, we're running out of time. Uh, I just want to um, tell people that they can, um, I want to thank everyone again. Um, uh, and the Wolf Institute um, and Gaston and Lucas and uh, Beth for jumping in and doing this um, great um, moderating and questioning. Um, if people want to reach me and find out more um, about my books, uh, they can visit thefightforfreespeech.com. I'm also uh, on social at, at Free Speech Book. Um, and uh, I'd love to, uh, to continue the discussion more with people uh, as well as um, uh, take my class at Brooklyn College. Um, so thanks very much, everyone. Appreciate it.